Hello, everybody, and welcome to Table Takes. Today is February 12th. And also, hey, for those uh, international people who happen to be in China, Gong Shi Fa Chai, Happy Lunar New Year as well. And we're going to go ahead and start this off, of course, with a new lunar year comes new beginnings. And Derek, tell us about the happiness that you are experiencing this week. It, it has been a whirlwind tour, I have to say, uh, because I think what a week or two ago was like, hey, I need to move real fast. Uh, since then, we have seen seven houses, put an offer in, had an inspection, uh, gotten the loan approved. Uh, we're closing in like three weeks. So we went we went very quickly from uh, where even will I live in two months to uh, I am frustrated that I have not even moved yet. And every morning is waking up in a mix of excitement and uh, we're not moved yet. <laughs> I I know it's been a tough time for you uh, and I appreciate that. I also want tips because Phil and I have looked for a house for like a year and had a tough time. So you like you have a level of expertise that I want to or an energy that I want to tap into. Uh, I think the the tip was be really lucky. Um, because both our both our realtor and our lender were both like this isn't how it works yeah like, this is <laughs> this, this does not happen so yeah. we don't know how you lucked into a house that you actually love at a price that's in your budget uh on a ridiculously fast timeline but congratulations nice the fates. Out into the universe yeah the fates combined and there's raccoons i'm sure at the house right yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there are. <laughs> All right. So wait, I mean, other than that, Emma, how, what have you been up to lately? Uh, mostly same old, same old. Uh, I have been catching up on Our Family Plays Games YouTube channel. Uh, I've talked about them before. They're a great content creator in space. I've uh, been watching the analysis paralysis video, which is really great for designers and players alike. I really love the way that they break it down and explain it in a way that actually makes sense. Because uh, analysis paralysis or AP is something that we talk about a lot in the board game industry, and we don't always explain it. So it's great to have a video that explains it in such a clear way. Uh, I also watched their Black History Month Spotlight, their first video. I believe they're doing videos throughout the course of the month uh, and learned a lot of great stuff. So I definitely suggest uh, Our Family Plays Games and check out their channel. And the videos just make me happy too. So I'm feeling, I watched one this morning and I'm just feeling like in a better mood because they're just, uh, they're wonderful people and I always have a good time watching them. Hmm. Very, very cool. And speaking about, since it is of course, Black History Month and also the Lunar New Year, things come together, right? To present Isabella with what you're up to this week. Yeah. So uh, one of the other things that I do is I work at this organization called the Langston that uh, uh, presents Black artists in the Seattle area. And uh, what we're doing uh, this month is that we're having a talk about, I'm sorry, my cat is freaking out. Um, uh, and uh, we're having a talk about the movie Rush Hour uh, with a local author, Vince Schwetweiler. And we're talking about the history of Black and Asian representation on film. Uh, we're using the movie Rush Hour as a way of kind of going into uh, the way that um, uh, the relationships between Black people and Asian people are presented sometimes for laughs and sometimes problematically. Um, and we're going to go into the history of uh, Black and Asian representation, um, or Black and Asian history in America as well, particularly where it pertains to things like the Black Panther Party um, and uh, the kinds of uh, uh, different kind of coalitions that uh, Black people and Asian people have done for, for years now. We never really talk about it in society. Um, and we should, because there's a lot of really great, great um, uh, social justice movements that have been spearheaded through Asian and Black cooperation. And uh, I'm very excited to talk about that. And that's tonight, uh, 6.30 Pacific. That's not how you say that word. Um, <laughs> When you say. need to use the bathroom that specific <laughs> time, not just <laughs> use it. <laughs> I was trying to, my brain was going into PM and then the time zone and it turned into PM specific. 
Um, uh, yeah. uh, and that's on the Langston uh, Facebook page. So you can just watch it uh, live as well. And so I'm really excited about that conversation. Um, yeah, that's it. Happy Lunar New Year. Uh, I'm the year of the rabbit and my Zodiac or my uh, thing said it was gonna have a good year for people in the year of the rabbit. So please be true. Um, please, I need it. My God. <laughs> nice. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Oh, well, I guess, I, I mean, you guys all have interesting things. I was just like, I, I backed a Kickstarter. I, 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 I'm more solo RPGs just play by myself. Yay! <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's other news that's related, but I won't talk about that. That's hinted in Kickstarters. That's more exciting things that I were doing. Hint, hint, it's something cool. Uh, but on that note, uh, I think we should just go ahead and talk about some surprising news in magic numbers. Emma, you want to talk about that? So we know it's been a year and we've talked before on the show about how a lot of board game stuff, including board game Kickstarters, are actually up over the last year. Some of it has been a, a little baffling because, you know, in a year when we really haven't been able to spend much time in person together, uh, all of these specifically in-person activities have been going up, have been making more money. Specifically, Magic the Gathering uh, apparently had an all-time high, all-time, all, all, time, all 30, 60 years, whatever, however long Magic has been around for. Uh, in Q4 2020, they had their best quarter ever. Uh, I <laughs> had to look at this for a while. It's one of those cases where I'm looking at my personal experience and I'm looking at my friends and trying to compare these things. No one I know is playing physical paper magic. There's a few people here and there playing Commander, but all my friends who usually go out and buy boxes and collect cards really aren't doing that. So uh, I did a little digging and it does look like Magic the Gathering Arena numbers are included in this increase. And that makes total sense because everyone I know who had done paper magic is now playing on Arena in a lot of cases more, a lot more than they would have played in paper magic. And Arena is monetized i think it's monetized in a good way but there's definitely a lot of ways to spend money in there for skins and special cards and for avatars and pets uh so you'd be proud of me i i bought uh a few packs of caldheim cards yeah cool. get, get that that metal the aesthetic not uh, not the music specifically but I know, I know you like that uh like rim aesthetic i didn't uh, get enough black cards though yeah <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how it goes, right? With the with the packs. But luckily, if you open up enough cards, you will get some wild cards. And then if you open up enough packs, you get wild cards. You can get any card you want. Just like press a couple of buttons and poof, there it's added to your collection. Uh, so I think there's the article, not necessarily misleading, but they're like, oh, you know, uh, people are staying home and playing board games and stuff. I think for Magic in particular and for Hasbro, which... Um, get into in just a second as a couple of areas in which they've increased, at least for Magic. I think a lot of that is in this video game version of this paper game. So it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition. People are playing the same game that they've always played, but playing it in a digital setting, in a digital format now. Um, and we've definitely seen some ways that the game has evolved now that it has a very large digital component to embrace that digitality. My only question is who is playing Monopoly in quarantine? <laughs> yeah. That is the worst idea because you're stuck. Now you're stuck with these people. Now I know that you are a cheater and a liar and a capitalist. And now I have to live with you next. It's just, it's too much. I think, no that's, one, called, I think that's called living with your family. No one yeah. plays Monopoly for fun. We play Monopoly in order to figure out who in the family is the most ruthless person. Uh, and who we should all shun. It's <laughs> it's not a good quarantine game to play when you're on like week 579 of quarantine. I have it, so many questions about that. It reveals a lot about you as a who person playing, playing this game. And, and I think it's, Monopoly is one of, if not the best-selling board game of all time. Uh, don't quote me on that, but through all the versions and stuff, it's it's definitely the game. I believe that. Yeah. When I people, mean, yeah. 
you ask the average person, not the average gamer, but the average person, what board games they can name. Monopoly is going to be what board games they played growing up. Monopoly is going to be one of the, those games. It is a very big part of our culture. And a lot of people, especially in the mass market, don't go out and buy a lot of games. They don't go out and learn a lot of games. So in this year, when things are tough, you know, it makes sense that they have that copy of Monopoly. They're not going out. They're they're like, hey, family, let's play a game together. Society uh, has moved past the need for Monopoly. We gotta okay. we gotta stop. Families are being torn asunder by this game. And I feel like we need to have a conversation about it as a culture. That's a lot of interventions we're going to have to have across the country. I'm just going to tell you, that's going to be an ongoing work. It's time. It's time we do it, Derek. Well, so, you know, like, that's actually an interesting question. Isabella, Hmm. if you had the ability to put uh, all of the Infinity Gems on and snap your finger (laughs) and all copies of Monopoly fade away to dust, what do you replace them with? Candyland. Oh, Candyland, not life? Candy, no, no. Mm. Why? Why would I want to play the game of life? I'm living the game of life. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'm stressed. Okay. <laughs> We're playing Candyland, that, mo- that movie. Oh my goodness. That game, uh, one of my favorite games growing up as a kid. And I forced uh, all, of, all of my family members to play that game ad nauseum. Uh, so, yeah, uh, they were also talking about making that game into a movie recently. Um, and I think, I think that's a, that's a great idea. If Monopoly is just, it's too, it's brutal. It's a brutal, Mm. uncaring, cold, cruel game. And (laughs) I do not, I do not condone it. We have so many family fights. In the the chat to Calico Mm -hmm. as as a game. Uh, Flatow Games is going to love hearing about that. And Wingspan also, shout out to Elizabeth Hargrave. So we have a couple Mm -hmm. of, uh, I will say though, that those are, I appreciate that. Those are definitely gamer games. And I think the replacement with Candyland, and you're absolutely right, as a game, a family can play together and have enjoyment, enjoy their time together. Yeah. And, and a game that has an end too, right? right. Yeah, I, will, I will say I haven't played Monopoly in years. I have heard that some of the newer versions have fixed some of the what I will say, even as a designer, core problems of things like the game can go on forever right. for just like hours and hours. Uh, some of the just reductive things, player elimination, like there, there's some things we can say like, you know, we can make things faster and easier and, and more fun. Uh, I'm so happy that we're doing this. I'm so happy that we're tearing Monopoly <laughs> apart. <laughs> but, Finally, but Emma, we're having mm-hmm. real discourse about it. Oh, yeah, Emma, speaking about Banzai, Ken, what would the yep. two of you pick? Ooh, for... A game that everyone what do you can replace? do? What do you replace Honestly, uh, no, the game that I would choose is just mine. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't, I don't know. What we're I wonder. We love I a wonder. plug. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but yeah, no, I guess uh, trying to think that that's something that would apply because the Candyland just fits that perfectly. But I always have, I don't know why in my heart, I always like um, like things with actual moving components. So like I always as a kid like Mancala, which is like a really, mm, like, it's wow. just because it's like, that's a, I just like Mancala. I don't no, know. I'm not shaming you. I was like, just, the I, haven't, I haven't thought about that game in so long. Yes, Mancala. Wow. That's like a, a game. <laughs> that like your grandparents brought back from the old country. That's like a, that's I, like a classic, yeah. a yeah. classic. I, I would wow. say maybe Sushi Go or No oh, Thanks yeah. uh, are two games that, or maybe Quicks. Like it's a little different because they're smaller games. It doesn't have the whole board presence to it, uh, but they are games in general that I've played with non-gamers that they enjoy and have a pretty easy time getting into so that would be my criteria for a game i think ticket to ride would probably be my pick oh ticket to ride, that's what yeah. I'd do. but that's like anyway the, yeah uh but i mean all of this talk especially now that my hat my mind is stuck on like sweets i think there's more sweet stuff in store right for magic <laughs> that's good <laughs> 
Yeah, so Magic the <laughs> Gathering is continuing with their secret lair drops with a special Valentine's Day drop that is live right now. You can go and check that out. Secret lair, as we mentioned before on the show, is special art versions of Magic the Gathering cards, alternate art. Uh, it also often has an arena component to it. So again, if you are playing digitally now, there's usually ways that you can get extra stuff for arena as well. Uh, lots of just really cute chibi art on these. So definitely recommend that you go and check out the link, look at the cards. If you are someone who likes the, the alternate art, um, especially as I mentioned, people are still playing commander in paper. So there's definitely some cards here, especially some of the goblin ones that are applicable for popular commander decks. So uh, I recommend you check that out if you like alternate art. An interesting thing, though, that happened in this Secret Lair announcement was the announcement of a card ban, uh, and that is Uro, which is a um, very bad degenerate card that gets you cards and just ramps you and it comes back from the graveyard. So if this is a very powerful card that has warped the format. It's being banned uh, in Pioneer, Modern and Historic. And they're continuing discussions about legacy. And they announced this in the secret layer drop, which is uh, applicable because they're making a alternate art version of the card. They're like, we're making this, but also it's being banned. It's just also kind of a funny way to announce the banning. They're banning so many cards now. It's just like, hey, we're just going to drop this in here. Surprise. Uh, yeah, so it's a, a interesting, more interesting news coming out of uh, Secret Layer Drops. Very, very, very cool. Well, I mean, there's just like, yeah. So things to covet to catch, maybe catch them all while also eating a burger, you think? Isabella, what do you what do you feel about that? We're crushing it today. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, like we talked about in an earlier episode, it's the anniversary, uh, the twenty fifth anniversary of Pokemon, and uh, part of that whole celebration is a tie in with uh, America's number one burger chain, Mac Wanalds. That's right. And so, what they're doing is is that they're doing a little kids meal, where inside the kids meal. One of the surprise little toys that you can get is a, a is a um, package of cards that you can play for uh, Pokemon. Unfortunately, this has resulted in a massive amount of scalpers and black market trading on, of the cards. This is such a huge bummer. Uh, one is because of the fact that um, you are... Uh, stealing from children, like, let's just be honest. Uh, some of these cards have gone on to, uh, I guess I can say the black market if it's just eBay, um, but uh, the the deep dark web known as the back pages of eBay. Uh, and some of these have been selling for, I mean, God, uh, three, four, five, 15 times as much as they're uh, worth. It's, it's um, something that happens uh, quite a bit uh, with these kinds of things where, uh, and these kinds of things, uh, by that I mean like rare fast food items, because I remember the great uh, fried chicken sandwich wars of uh, 2019, 2020, uh, when I was desperately trying to get a Popeye's chicken and a man uh, offered to sell me a Popeye's chicken for $25 in the parking lot. Uh, and that- um, Did you take that deal? <laughs> no, I did not take that deal. <laughs> because I had so many questions. How yeah. old was the sandwich? When did you buy this sandwich? Why are you doing this, sir? Why are you You did selling? not have a certificate of authenticity to present along with the sandwich? <laughs> we lived there through such good sandwiches, dark times. <laughs> They were, and I never got one because I refused to wait in the line and I refused to buy it from a sandwich scalper. Um, you can, scalper. You can get them now. Oh you can God. get them now. I don't have to now wait in line. Yeah, yeah. now I don't have a car. I can't, I can't drive out of Oh. Home. It's a yeah. whole thing. One of these days I will get one of these sandwiches, but I still have the trauma. Um, so uh, I'm looking at an eBay listing right now of a pack of 150 cards that's selling for $780. Um, and it seems to be a combination of uh, adult people who are obviously trying to um, resell these limited edition uh, cards uh, and then also 
there seems to be a thriving sort of resurgence of, uh, and this is like no shade to anybody, but um, YouTube influencers, YouTubers who are also kind of fueling this. Um, mm. And I think that this is really a conversation that's that we need to have about the idea of like, um, not letting your enjoyment of a, a toy or a card or a game uh, turn you into a terrible person. These are for children. They literally come inside of a Happy Meal. Uh, you are taking these things from children. They've had a shortage now mm. uh, where kids have shown up to McDonald's uh, and not been able to get their cards. Uh, uh, recently, McDonald's though has done, uh, has released uh, an announcement that they are going to be manufacturing more cards to try to make up for um, this whole situation. Um, but at the same time, if you are buying Happy Meals in order to scalp these cards, you really need to look deep inside of yourself mm. at what you're doing with your life. Um, it's just dis distressing to so watch. So maybe the people who are scalping these cards were the same people who played too much Monopoly as children <laughs> and their family realized that they are the ones that they shouldn't be trusting and they learned the wrong lessons from that game. Yeah. You heard it here, folks. Uh, here first, folks. Derek says, down with capitalism. Uh, and <laughs> I could not agree more. Yes, I, I, I think that, you know, the fun of Pokemon, I'm really happy that Pokemon seems to have sort of like a, a new life. Um, there's a lot more Pokemon players that I'm seeing on social media, a lot more people kind of, I think it's, it's kind of people in their 20s and 30s who were kind of the first gen or second gen players who are now adults now who are like, I can buy finally the entire collection of every kind of Pokemon card that I wanted as a kid. Um, but at the same time, there is a current generation of children who are learning to play Pokemon for the first time. And those two generations of players, I think are kind of having, they're, they're clashing and it's, I don't know. For me well, personally- I, mean, like, I think we've, we've seen that yeah. same kind of culture clash with Star Wars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Star Trek with, yeah. you know, with anything that we grew up on as kids, uh, it's really hard when you're a huge fan of something to remember that it's always going to be someone else's first time into the thing. Yeah. Yeah. D&D uh, mm -hmm. you know, is having the same issue right now, too. Uh, like it's it's all across the board. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the other thing that occurred to me with the, the Pokemon question is it, I was never in the Pokemon scene, as it were. But it always felt to me like there were two different groups of Pokemon fans. There were the video game players and there were the card game players. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the video game players would buy some of the cards, but they mm -hmm. I never really saw them play it. It seemed like they were very different groups there. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because it's it's totally kind of different than I, I feel like a lot of other game systems. But there seemed to never really be, as somebody who plays the games and who also played the card games as well there never really seemed like there was any sort of animosity whereas for some some different kinds of groups it's like oh if you play the card game versus the game you're not a real player or mm. you're kind of an old school player and there seems to be some kind of there for Pokemon it never really seemed like there was any sort of animosity because the games are super fun uh, mm -hmm. and usually it's usually what I've noticed is that if you play the card game, that it's a gateway drug to eventually getting the, the video game. Mm. Uh, and if like you Pokemon play the video Go game, was a grand unifier too. Yeah. yeah it's just, yeah. Oh yeah. Pokemon is so. like one of those things where it's so hard to have a bad time in Pokemon. Um, but at the same time, I don't know. It, it feels like these people who are scalpers are, um, are people who have nostalgia for the culture of Pokemon but who are not actual players. It just feels like they're seizing upon an economic opportunity to exploit people's um, uh, nostalgia and to exploit new players. Uh, that's yeah. my perspective. I have, I have a grain of, or I got a pebble to, to throw in people's shoes with this, uh, that I, I kind of, with my, I have a, like, I'm not crazy, but there's conspiracy up afoot with me. Uh, so how I see this now with a lot of like these, uh, like broadcasters, influencers and scalpers, um, there's a bigger op like question whether or not they are promoting essentially gambling with these mystery cards and people like they make it more of the opening of the decks and seeing what you get 
more of the prize versus what I'm going to, oh, like I'm going to build this deck. This is cool. I like this like card because this is my favorite Pokemon kind of thing. It takes away from the love and they're starting now to make it so like, you know how there was back in the day where like um, CSGO, like opening up those trunks, that's essentially the same thing except more in a physical sense. At least to me, it seems like, uh, yeah, I remember loving like the cards that I got um, and being excited about opening it. But now in this, especially in America, this today culture, we start to like essentially uh, idolize the fact of people just opening up cards and just like trashing things that they don't yes. like and going through them yeah. really, really quickly. Yeah. And I you see that with a lot of like collectors and when, when things start to like have a, like, especially nowadays, of course, like people are like, oh, I got this like Charizard that could be worth like half a million dollars. And so like it steps away from the actual card plane and the actual art and the is, love is that, of the genre. I, I so. don't disagree with that, mm. but I do disagree that that's a new thing. Um, I still maintain that Antiques Roadshow is the root of the collapse of modern uh, TV. This is a uh, hot take. Yeah, yeah. I, wow. I, I blame Antiques Roadshow for the rise of reality TV. Uh, and I hate it. I hate it. Wow. Uh, I mean, like, it, it, I think we're seeing it with these things that are close to us right now. Mm. And it, everything always feels like it's happening now. But this kind of stuff, the the desire to watch rich people indulge in their excess, uh, combined with the excitement of opening up a thing and getting a surprise, like all those elements have been there forever. Well, I will say that this reminds me a lot of, I also play this game called Fate Grand, Go, Fate, um, oh my goodness, Fate Grand Order. Um, I don't mm. know if you guys are into that at all. Um, it's a it's a Japanese game, um, but oh. essentially it's a digital game where you have to collect cards in order to play them in the game. Mm. Um, and that has resulted in a huge market of farming uh, where there'll just be people who will just like do the, it's essentially gambling because yeah. you're pulling this lever and you're getting random cards and they'll farm things for you and then you can pay them in order to get only the good cards. And that market, like, there's whole, there's been, like, exposés of, like, whole, like, um, uh, rings in China of just fake grand order farming things. I know this has happened in other sort of games. And it's sort of like, well, what's the fun then? If it's, if you're playing up against a player who has farmed all of their good cards and yeah. has the best cards. So I think that, that this is a combination of what you're saying, Derek, combined together with this sort of new idea of om only farming for good for good cards and and that's kind of a new sort of technological well, but, but like how is that different from 20 years ago when you could go buy magic singles well mm -hmm. i think it's it's yeah. very much accelerating i would say yeah. and this is something that has ha i've evolved this way myself my friends were more experienced with magic and they would get magic packs and they would look at the last card you know, they'd just be like, what's, what's my rare? And I'd be like, what's wrong? And I would like be going through my cards one at a time, maybe a little bit to troll because they were like, what do you got? What do you got? I'm like, I want to look at all the cards that I got. But in the beginning, I generally did have that feeling. It's like, oh, what are these different cards in here? And then as you get more familiar and you get more into it, then like with the, um, you on Arena, you can open 10 packs at a time and it just shows you all your rares. It doesn't even show you your common cards that you've got in those packs. So a lot of stuff is a lot of people are getting into that part of it. And then a lot of games and stuff are pushing people more and more because it's more profitable. The more packs people open, it's like the more it's capitalism again. So I think it elements of that have been, but as the technology improves, as we have like gotcha games and stuff, then yeah. it just pushes more and more. So they want more and more money and they push people into these behaviors. So it's something yeah. that's definitely accelerating over time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. That's sad. You guys just love all your Pokemons, you know, yeah. your, your Psyducks and your Dittos, <laughs> you know, they're and all just, special. they're all special. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, going ahead, uh, since we did get a little bit off the topic, we're going to go ahead and slap that train right back in on its tracks. And we're going to be moving on to, uh, speaking about capitalism. Hey, let's talk about, uh, <laughs> something else that, Hey, depending on however you feel about it, uh, Asmodee did, uh, did purchase board game arena. 
Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but basically during the pandemic time, uh, like a lot of people have been switching over to online games uh, and getting that kind of like feel of being connected while still being very, very, very apart. So uh, Asmodee, Rakhine, um Board Game Arena, the digital multi, if you don't know what Board Game Arena is, it's the digital multiplayer platform with about 250 online games and 40 different languages and over 5 million subscribers. Uh, so I'll go ahead and quote from the head strategy uh, of our strategist uh, at Osmo Day is our growth is based off of one critical commitment, offering the best gaming experiences to consumers and bringing our brand to the widest audience, having a platform that allows players from all over the world to meet, play uh, their favorite games together or discovering new games is a natural fit alongside uh, our amazing catalog of board games. Uh, Board Game Arena, founded in, of course, by 2010 by uh, Gregory Isabelli, I want to say that's how you, Isabelli, and uh, Emmanuel Collins uh, will be joining Asmodee and operating independently from their current management team. Uh, so Asmodee well, uh, operating yeah. independently with their current men. Oh, with their okay, with their current team. Sorry, uh, but yeah. So it's it's uh, we'll have to go ahead and see what uh, is produced out of this. But I mean, do you have any anyone in this? Uh, any of you all have any particular feelings? I guess it's certainly big news. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it it validates the expectation that. Um, board game arena and online platforms to play board games are certainly not going to go anywhere as when they wouldn't have bought them uh, if they thought they were going to disappear or fail once the quarantine is over. That's for certain. It's yeah. interesting to me as I have not used it yet for my scale of mostly the ones I use most tabletop simulator, tabletopia, and then board game arena. So it's a little like, tier three player in the game from what I see. It, it's interesting because if I had imagined them buying Tabletop Simulator, I'd be like, wow, you know, that changes a lot specifically because there's a lot of games that were put up on Tabletop Simulator without anyone's position, uh, permission. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure what Board Game Arena looks like, if it has the same workshop with a lot of games or if the games there have all been verified. But both both Board Game Arena and Tabletopia um, don't allow people to just publish whatever they want, basically. Yeah. There, there's at least some vetting process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think having more financing behind this and having a team with the board game backing to it and a history to it i think that's that's great i would love to see almost more competition in this space because there's definitely all the players right now are kind of independent you know and there's pros and cons there's things that a lot of us wish would be fixed but there's not as much competition i think having a player in the field that is pushing it to a space where it could be more accessible to the average person is great and pushing the innovation ideally of the of all of this space you know everyone has to up their game in order to be competitive in this space i think is cool asma day also has a digital division that has been publishing a lot of um, mobile uh, adaptations and a lot of um, adaptations of board games in the steam uh, storefront so it'll be really interesting to see how or if Board Game Arena interacts with whatever larger plans they had for digital distribution and adaptation of their properties. But yeah, so we'll have to see. It's exciting news. Um, it's news, like very big news. So we just have to see what comes out of it. Hopefully something great. Oh, speaking about stuff that has been going digital, Derek, you have passions, passions. Tell us about your passions, Derek. Uh, well, my passions are apparently small and made of plastic. Um, but in particular, the Warhammer 40K app is finally out of beta. So it's no longer free. Um, the kind of core features have been locked in for the most part. Um, it's going to cost two pounds or about three-ish dollars a month now. They reduced the price a little bit. We talked about it before, but it allows you to kind of look at core rules, um, you know, release facts. You can build an army. You can refer to any units. If you buy the print books, you can scan or not. You can't scan. You can manually enter a code in the back of the book 
to add the game to your library and stuff like that. Um, so they've definitely built a foundation. There's a lot of features that they say are still going to be coming down the road, like support for, you know, crusade play where your army kind of grows and changes over time and you give special character traits to individual units and stuff like that. Um, but it has officially uh, exited beta. You can build your list. You can share your list. They have a monthly contest where you can make a list and share it and you might win that full list uh, from their store and stuff like that. Uh, so if you've been looking for an alternative to a number of the third party sites uh, or services that allow similar army building tools, uh, you can check this official one out now. Ooh, very, very official. Well, hey, by the way, quick reminder, if you guys didn't know, did you know that February is Black History Month? And you know what you got to do. Let's go ahead and hype up all of those creators that you might have not paid attention to. Emma, tell us about it. BGG is spotlighting some amazing Black creators for Black History Month. Every day of the month, they're making a spe specific highlight of board game designers, content creators, store owners, just, just amazing people within the industry. So it's the 12th. They've gone through 12 people so far. Uh, we're going to have the link there if you keep an eye on BGG or they're tweeting out every day the links to the individual spotlights is how I'm keeping track of it. I did want to run down and talk real quick about the people who have been highlighted so far. Uh, I can't do them justice, obviously, in the amount of time that we have, but wanted to give a shout out there and definitely check out the list and read all the amazing accomplishments uh, as well. Uh, first off, we have Jennifer Schlickburn, who is the co-designer of Advanced Civilization in 1991. Jeremy Howard, who covers games as J Jambalaya Plays Games, is very active, uh, especially on board game Twitter. Kara Ryan and Marcus Ross, who are the game publisher Water Bear Games and have released several games. Mick Starla and Grant Fitch of Our Family Plays Games, which I gave a shout out before. YouTube channel covering all things games. Eric Slauson, game designer of Tattoo Stories and Nerd Words Science. Tim Metivier from Meepleville Board Game Cafe. Really cool cafe. Definitely check out the pictures. They have like a, a meeple entrance to, to the cafe, which is super cool. Alfonso Smith Jr., sales manager at the Warhouse, a game store in Long Beach, California that's been open since 1976 and also president of the Random Board Gamers Guild. Mandy Hutchinson, co-host of the Dice Tower to Die For YouTube channel and just has been doing amazing stuff in the industry for years. Dion Mixon, game designer of Design Eye. Eric Yurko, game reviewer, What's Eric Playing? Huge channel and page within the industry. If you have not seen this yet, you've been hiding under a rock. Uh, for Tessa Elise, board game designer, book of villainy, wicked and wise, and also recently became a game producer at Funko Games and is now here in Seattle, which is super exciting. Uh, and also Omari Akil and Hamu Dennis, board game designers and publishers of Rap Gods and Hoop Gods. And this is going to be continuing for the rest of the month. So make sure you bookmark this page, keep an eye on it so you can keep track of all these really cool people who are doing stuff in the space. Yeah, got to give the hype, got to give the hype. And remember, uh, you can just give the hypes to all of these people all year round. Just doesn't have to be this month, folks. Exactly. Just letting you know. Um, but now on very exciting nerd news, Isabella, tell us about what's it. Um, yeah, so uh, we talked about this earlier, but uh, in a previous episode, but there has been the announcement of a D&D movie that's uh, slated to happen. And there's now been the announcement of two new uh, characters or two new actors that are going to be involved in the franchise. So it looks like it's actually happening. Um, I know that there was some kind of conversation about whether or not this was like actually a real thing, but it looks like it's a real thing. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez has been added to the roster. You might know her most famously for being in the Fast and Furious movies. Um, and also Justice Smith has been added as well. He's been in Jurassic World, The Fallen Kingdom, and Detective Pikachu, uh, and also one of the best episodes of Drunk History, if you watch that show, um, that's out there. Um, uh, and I'm actually very excited about this. Um, it looks like they are going for a, quote, cross between Guardians of the Galaxy and Pirates of the Caribbean, 
which is uh, two franchises. So there you go. <laughs> <That exists>. um, <laughs> they're both uh, money makers. So there you are. Um, and the way that the characters have been described uh, is that Chris Pine, who has already been announced as one of the leads of the uh, movie, is a battle tested hero. Michelle Rodriguez plays a fierce warrior, and which will Justice... be a huge departure from her normal. <laughs> let me let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Smith, who will be playing a half elf wizard who lacks confidence in himself but is funny and lovable. Um, all of these sound uh, completely typecasting and completely predictable. Um, and I wanted to know you got your guys' thoughts about how you feel about how um, honestly two-dimensional these characters really sound. <sighs> I, <laughs> Collective I hope, sigh. I, I, hope, I hope that this is just kind of going to be the face of it. Like they're going to just like, you know, kind of pull a, like, I really hope that it's just going to be a pull all the rogue, or like, you know, rope carpet. Rug. What are Rug. these things called? Rug. Yep. Rug, Whatever, rug, yes. rug from Shake under us, like you know, because because that'd be the thing, like me and my conspiracy of like oh just put these two dimensional characters out and then surprise people with a surprise punch in the face, being like, look, look, this is the basics, and then like you know, come and backhand them and like, haha, you thought it was gonna be basic, but no, that's that's you, what you I are, hope. that's what you I are want. setting a very high optimistic bar for a D and D movie. I want launching I mean, a new franchise. But but look, Detective Pikachu. Okay, like yes. talk about it, Emma. Talk I it. Mm -hmm. I like seeing the trailers and like weird live action Pokemon. I was like I, like this. I watched the movie. That movie was amazing. That movie was very good. Justice Smith was so good. I just can't like. I, I can't see anything. But is there any connection between that movie and this other than Justice? He will um, make the movie amazing. He will oh, make no, the movie no, just, amazing. Yes. <laughs> just the fact taking a movie with a premise again, the Pokemon premise, which in a detective and their life, it, it could have sure. gone really badly. Just like with this DNA movie, it could go really badly, or it could be a, a, a surprise gem. It, it certainly, so. it certainly could be. But I mean, all of this is pretty generic. It sounds like a pretty generic action movie. That just happens to have the D and D name on it, um, and it happens what? to be fantasy. So, like, I mean, there's not a lot there that excites me. Um, I haven't seen any of Justice's movies, but it sounds great. But like, there's not a lot here that jazzes me. But I've all like I've long been kind of questioning the value of a D and D movie um, because I don't like. I have some fundamental questions about what D and D means to people. Uh, and there's not a lot of consistent visual cohesion there. You know what well, I mean? Well, what I will say, though, the three things that really tie Detective Pikachu, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, and also uh, Pirates of the Caribbean is that all three of those franchises, when initially they were announced, none of them, I mean, like, the, the idea that you were going to make a movie based on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disneyland Nobody thought that that was going to be successful. The Guardians yes. of the Galaxy is one of the most canceled comic books uh, in Marvel history. Hmm. Nobody's a huge Guardians of the Galaxy fan, not before the movies came out. Nobody knew what that movie was going to be. And then the De Detective Pikachu, just like Emma said, I went to go see it and I thought, okay, this will be like a cute money grab. And then it was this whole like family drama. Yeah. This whole like really emotional movie yes. about trying to find like your, you know, your your found family versus your actual family mm -hmm. and a connection between father and son. And it was like <laughs> this whole thing. Yeah. And so I I feel like maybe what they're doing is kind of what um Bonsai was talking about, which is like, here's something very generic, you guys. It's mm -hmm. just going to be a fun fantasy flick and then we're going to watch the movie and it's going to be a commentary on anti-capitalism and, and <laughs> family. I feel like we're going to have, I feel like after this comes out, we're going to have to have a very special episode of Table Takes where all three of you get to work through the different stages of grief after having seen the movie and not living wow. up to your culture. No, no, but, but, but. Wow. <laughs> Or it could be like, you know, uh, or sorry, Emma, do you want to go first? Go ahead. 
Uh, well, just putting it into it, making it a four factor instead of those three movies. So trifecta, <laughs> making it a four factor uh, World of Warcraft movie. You know, the people looking at that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Was I making it? <laughs> we all made faces at the same time. <laughs> And then it turned out to be not. It, it I think you were all just. I, I think you're remembering when you were surprised and amazed by a thing. It would be wonderful for it to happen here, but you know, until we see some sign of that from the writers and the directors and the producers, I don't know. Like, we'll see. I'm. I, I still like. If they had said, "Hey, it's a Forgotten Realms movie," even with the fact that I don't actually really, I'm not into the Forgotten Realms. I would be more into the movie if it said it was Forgotten Realms or Dragonlance or a thing or a new one or Eberron or, or something like that. But when you make it a D&D, D&D to me is so generic that it doesn't give me an emotional thing to be excited about other than there's going to be a red dragon at some point. Well, and like, that's not enough to get me to go to the theater. So well, uh, we'll have to see who the director is. And, mm -hmm. yeah. But well, we I think like another note, is. everyone knows like historically... Like, I'm sorry, but D and D movies have. Mm, uh, There's only so been maybe, one. There's only been one, and it was made like 15 years ago. That's not historical precedence, though. <laughs> I'm just saying that maybe it's just like they're they're putting this out now, and they're gonna flip us on. Like, it depends on maybe if they bring some writers, maybe from like <clears throat> NPC. Um, you know, like the book I've been reading. But they, but I I hate to say this, Bonzo. Like, we already. Well, we already know who the writer and directors are. Mm -hmm. um, they they don't have a good history. <laughs> I oh, mean, well, no. that's not that's not saying that they don't have they have they have a fine they have an adequate film history. Okay, they have made adequate films, you know. And like I I agree. Like if they were going to get people who were writers on previous kind of a thing, that's that that like remains to be seen. It's not like the DCEU where it's like we know that those movies have been historically bad. Yeah, I said it. Come at me. Uh, and so we can, <laughs> we can all we can all kind of guess like where um, where the movies are headed in the future. I just I I I want to see your face, Derek. I want to see your face when the movie is good and launches a franchise and launches a television series. It'll be and... a big smile. Fantastic. <laughs> Like, I mean, so like, honestly, I'm not expecting it to be as bad as the last D&D movie. I think yeah. that we've had a lot of fantasy properties that have come out since then that have legitimized the genre. Um, so I'm not expecting anything near that bad. Um, like, but I kind of still, my optimistic hope is that we're going to get something that's maybe at the level of like an average MCU movie or a bad MCU movie where like, it's a ton of fun and then it's bad over MCU and you're movie? fine. Is that... The worst MCU movie will be like the best D and D movie. I guess that's how it translates. That's kind of what I'm expecting. I just feel like there's no winning though. I feel like even if the movie won Academy Awards, I feel like you would still be dissatisfied. I I I want well, to. Uh, I don't care about Academy Awards, so that would be a side. <laughs> if the movie were good, I would be perfectly satisfied. Yes. I just want to see you happy one of these days, Derek. <laughs> It's not gonna happen. Well, then let's redo together. <laughs> hey, let's redo Bam. together. Yeah, that still has to come out. But in any case, <laughs> uh, we we just have we have lots of theories and lots of things, and we're gonna go wild with our imagination. And uh, this will we just have to like before we go completely off into outer space. Let's go ahead and reach a settlement and ground Crushing ourselves. It. We're crushing it today. Eric, can you tell well, us? On the topic of settlements and uh, uh, competing sides coming together in peace, I guess, um, yeah. Gale Force 9 and WotC, we reported that there was a contractual dispute. There was some lawsuits back and forth. Um, they have apparently reached a settlement and are kind of returning to the status quo, it sounds like. Um, we still don't really know exactly what motivated the original dispute on the lawsuits. We don't know what the terms of the settlement are. So we don't know uh, how much will change going forward. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see if uh, Gale Force 9 behaves differently or if the relationship changes. Um, but we reported on it before coming up. So we figured that we would let everybody who still remembered, you know, after the, the marathon year that we have had, uh, that the lawsuit was still pending and has now been resolved. So everyone's rampant speculation 
about how WotC was trying to void all their contracts so they could do sixth edition D and D and sell D and D off to somebody else can maybe pack those away for another year or two. Mm. All right. Well, folks, that was our headlines now, and it's time to get in the zine. The zine quest. Starting. Go ahead. <laughs> Those so are like get in the zine, like get in the zone. Yeah. Uh, the auto zone. The <laughs> auto zone. All right, Emma, what do you got for us? First up for Zine Quest, I have a Tangled Web Volume 1 with three days left, ending Monday, February 15th. It's a set setting neutral fantasy zine filled with interesting NPCs and the relationships that bind them, and worksheets to roll your own. What attracts me most to this zine is. Uh, in the campaigns that I've played through, the ones with very careful relationship development between the characters have been the most successful ones. I know a lot of people make their characters and dive right into it uh, and have a fine time playing that way. But I've also heard from other people that it's tough. You know, why are we together as a party? Why are we, why am I staying with you? Like things, I just saw someone die. Why am I not running away to the circus or whatever? You know, I think establishing those relationships can be a very powerful way to especially enhance the role-playing side of it, which is what I, I really like in role-playing games. Not everyone does, even though that's what they're called. Some people just want to roll dice and do math, but I like the parts where your character is sitting by the campfire late at night doing a watch and another character comes up and you have a heartwarming story or you unveil a dark secret and it completely changes the direction of the You like the, the feelings. I, the feels. That's what I want. That's all. The feels. I mean, the the fighting is is fine too. It's it's can be a good break, but I love the feels. So uh, a lot of systems, such as D and D, don't really have a built-in way to do this. When I've played D and D before and built relationships, our, our DM has used tools from other systems that have things like roll a dice on the table. Each character decides based on that how they're connected to each other character and you go around. Um, so I love tools like that. This scene has, or just has NPCs with relationships and also ways to build relationships. So I think that's cool. You should check it out. A Tangled Web, Volume 1. Sweet. Well, the first project I want to talk about uh, is an expansion for this kind of old indie RPG, Lacuna. Uh, and this is Lacuna Read Once and Destroy. Uh, it's got 10 days left. It ends on uh, February 22nd. It's 40 pages long, um, and it's just kind of a bunch of locations around what they call the Blue City. But, like, it's really kind of hard to describe what Lacuna is about. Um, it's a very vague, creepy, conspiracy y kind of thing. You're basically playing these agents who are exploring this dream world that is filled with a city but some of the people in the city are also spiders or they have spider heads or there's insects kind of at the borders and stuff like that and there's a very like cold war paranoia who is on your side who is not who's been like what is real are you already playing the game is everything like there's a lot of really who can you trust what is real what are you even experiencing elements of it and it's it was one of the kind of indie RPGs that I think was at the forefront of the current movement that we're seeing a huge blossoming of. Uh, so it's really exciting to see a new installment in that. Uh, and I am super jazzed. And if you like weird uh, kind of let's explore our scary dreams together uh, kind of RPGs with a bit of a Cold War paranoia, uh, who is a spider person laid on top of it? Lacuna, read once and destroy. Awesome. So what I have next is called City of Flesh and it has six days left. Um, I was really inspired by this one, uh, not only because of the fact that uh, an entire City of Flesh is a really cool idea for me, um, but because it's a tarot-based role-play game and I love, love, love anything that's tarot-based. I think it's a really cool mechanic. This is a dungeon crawl uh, game and the two kind of things that it takes its basis on, uh, which is also like perfectly aligned for me as well, is the grim dark aesthetic and femcore. Uh, so it's a, it's a feminine grim 
core dark game and I absolutely love that um and so yeah it's uh, basically a um tarot game dungeon call where you're trying to save off the end of the world with a very heavy feminine touch to it so it's goth but girly at the same time uh so yeah city of flesh with six days left all right. Now, uh, with six days left, Thursday, February 18th, uh, Mage to Order. Uh, basically, you ever wanted to kind of like, I love role-playing games where you just play the NPC nobodies that just like get things done. Like, you know, you can go with heroes that do mythic quests, but what about the little people? Well, this is a, a tabletop uh, RPG that, or well, sorry, RPG about uh, being a magical maintenance worker in a spa- sprawling tech nomadic city it's a very like you know humor tongue-in-cheek kind of thing about being a worker trying to keep this mega tech city working you know while magic is going on and you know craziness uh the game is driven with a 2d6 system um uh, every character having a mundane skill and a magical specialty uh the worse you are at your mundane skill the better you are at magic just to kind of balance things out uh the magic rules are fairly light uh with the freedom uh, they try to con- encourage like basically being creative and improving. uh it's bet it's like you can either do this as a one shot or as an episodic uh campaign the cooler thing I think about it that you should just check it out is how they're like going to present and print out all of the various different hard copies of the Mage to Order zine. Uh, it's printed on uh, like a like an employee manual with the character sheet being a time card, you know, the ones where you just like stick in and it kind of thing uh, that that's that it's it's the package aesthetics that win for me. Um, and so if you like that extra aesthetic and just want to be like, yo, we got to, I want to be a nobody in this world, but also time card, uh, <laughs> go ahead and get it. It has 60 is left. Mage to order. Up next, we have Definitely Wizards, a game about not being a wizard with eight days left ending Saturday, February 20th. It's a rules light comedy fantasy TTRPG about pretending to be a wizard. All you need is a few friends, D6s, way to take notes and a few hours to play. In a world where you're supposed to follow a certain path and study a lot to get a license, people are trying to sneak through the system. So it's basically finding shortcuts through the wizard licensing system. Uh, so managing this bureaucracy where it's a world in which as we see a lot with wizards you know it's like you got to study you got to be 200 years old you got to do all this stuff and they're saying like well what if i just learned it in the woods or like off the back of a cereal box or something so wizards shortcuts uh bucking the system if all those sound things sound great to you you should check out definitely wizards a game about not actually being a wizard and trying to be certified so you can actually practice wizardry without having to spend all the money and give away years of your life. (laughs) So the next project I wanted to talk about was the tower and the garden. So this has six days left. uh, And this is what's calling a, or calling itself a cyber metal fantasy. Uh, And I mean, seems pretty perfect for me. Like it's borrowing a whole lot of stuff from cyberpunk. You've got corporations, you've got some technology, you've got uh, a, a kind of fortress or city where the super elite live and you play people who live in the trash bags that are scattered around their house, basically. But then also the, you know, uh, evil tyrant has declared war on a demon lord far on the distance and there's magic and there's weird monsters that stalk the night. So uh all of that sounds fantastic uh for kind of a, a fun little adventure i'm getting a lot of vibes of um battle angel alita and stuff like that from this but with some supernatural stuff um and uh it's based on blades in the dark which is another big bonus in my book and jordan shively uh i, I think that's how you pronounce his last name uh hottest singles on twitter uh is a stretch goal to write the descriptions for the demon lords so if anybody is familiar with his work you know that means there will be a lot of teeth involved uh so this is like a weird creepy setting borrowing from a lot of different kinds of stuff that i like and a lot of times this chocolate and peanut butter goes real well together uh next i have lichcraft an rpg about trans 
necromancers with six days left ending on Thursday, February 18th. Um, I'm really excited about this one. This one is the whole premise of it is that you live in the year 2069 and you are waiting still on the British government to give you uh, access to your, to your gender affirmant surgery. And it's taking so long that you decide that you're going to beat the system uh, by becoming a lich and living forever. Um, I think that this is a really awesome uh, kind of idea. It, it talks a lot about the, uh, if, if you're not familiar with the NHS, which is the National Health Service in Britain, uh, it's, if you can imagine a world where, where we get universal health care, I know in America, it's, it's a strange sort of a thing to talk about, but uh, the NHS, uh, apparently it takes a very long time to get a lot of uh, access to trans healthcare in the UK. And so this RPG zine is a commentary on deciding to become immortal uh, so that you can wait out the long waits. Uh, and so this game, it's a very rules light kind of a game for two players uh, and you're trying to collect all of the different things inside of a dystopian uh, British world so that you can become a lich necromancer and wait the 300 years so that you can finally get a call back from the NHS so that you can finally get your gender affirmation surgery. <laughs> um, and I absolutely love the premise of it. So that is, uh, yeah, lichcraft. I, um, sorry, an RPG about trans necromancers with uh, six days left. Up next, we have Apothecaria, a solo journaling RPG with 10 days left, ending Monday, February 22nd. It's a potion-making journaling RPG set in a cozy fantasy world with inspiration from Theme Hospital, Stardew Valley, and Ghibli Films. I mean, what more do you need to know? The potions you create and the stories that unfold come together to create a beautiful journal that is unique and personal to you. It's by Anna Blackwell, who's the creator of Delve, Rise, and Umbra, a trio of map drawing games. I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of these zines that pull me in just have to describe an aesthetic or a feeling that is going to be created by playing this game. The one I have coming up a little later is very much in that sphere. So I almost don't even care about the rules. Also, solo journaling is very much in my vibe right now. So I love Stardew Valley and I love Ghibli films. So I just want to be in there and just feel that happy, productive uh, aesthetic. Where you're just making a thing and selling a thing and everyone is friends with each other. Um, yeah, it just sounds super fun. So if you want to make potions and you want to journal and you want to play a game by yourself, Apothecaria with 10 days left. So if you like things like Dune, Firefly, <laughs> Alien, Cowboy Bebop, Spaghetti Westerns, uh, Mothership, or Ultraviolet Grasslands, then you have 11 days to journey to the desert moon of Karth with me. Uh, and I, I mean, like... A, a list of inspirations like that, giving me some kind of uh, bounty hunters just past the edge of civilization in a vaguely Western desert kind of environment. Uh, like I, I'm in, uh, like, I, I don't know what more I have to say, uh, but I love many of those things very, very dearly. Uh, and, you know, there's little hints about like you're harvesting bones out in the desert that, that might make you immortal or like you might get kidnapped and your organs get harvested. Like, Sign me up. Sounds like a fun time. Uh, and that has 11 days left. Desert Moon of Karth. Uh, I love it. To read more about good vibes, I have Hibernation Games, five journaling RPGs for solo play. Noticing a theme here. Four days left, ending Wednesday, February 17th. Uh, Zine Quest Anthology of Single Player Pen and Paper Games by Lucian Khan, Gian Shim, Anna Anthropy, Vigitia Valetti, and Will Jobst. Uh, some amazing designers on this list. I love that they're collaborating and coming together. Uh, the theme is literal and metaphorical hibernation, the icy cold, the spooky and cozy mood, moments of solitary reflection, allure of the cave and the underworld. Again, all just big aesthetic vibe things. I've said before that I want to make a, a game that feels like drinking a hot cup of cocoa on a snowy day. So I'm very much in here for all these vibes. Uh, 
backers of hibernation games is a stretch gold is unlocked for an extra pdf scene a new set of role tables for creating fantasy gender systems written by lucian khan with cover art by jabari weathers this is an awesome group of diverse creators absolutely recommend to back this um exciting stuff hibernation games with four days left well you know what's important to do after you have hibernated <laughs> season away wake up and steal a giant robot so with 11 days left uh the, the another project i love is stealing the throne uh and if anybody remembers the old anime escaflone that is one of the all-time classics like this is a gmless version of go steal an escaflone and see what happens uh basically like you know there's some ancient war and like 12 giant robots were made to fight the war and now the, the rich and powerful use them to rule their domains go steal one uh and you know it, it's gmless it's a short game there's no prep uh you know like it, it breaks everything down into the planning the heist the getaway that has kind of an interesting setup of somebody plays the throne which is like the world they take on some of the GM elements, but not all of them. And then someone plays the thief who's trying to steal it. And then the third player plays like all the other NPCs kind of in the rest of the world. Uh, and then, you know, they explicitly say at the end, you get the robot and get to describe what kind of horrible chaos you unleash when you run around with it. So uh, I love Escafone is really the moral of the story here. And I'm excited <laughs> about this. All right, you know how I hinted earlier anew, so full disclosure, uh, this uh, this zine that I'm going to be promoting with 10 days left, uh, Wednesday, February 24th, is made by my partner, uh, Mr. B, my husband. Uh, he um, has made this, it's called Before Fire, the comedy aqua, uh, cave dwelling RPG. Uh, basically, uh, a tabletop comedy RPG about hitting things with clubs and role playing like your cave dweller. Um, so we've, I've basically got into play test this a bunch of times here, for example, uh, the whole, I, the main idea, it's a, it's a rules like comedy game, one shot RPG, uh, where you play quick cave drillers trying to like go through this journey to save your tribe. Um, the main idea is that you're very limited with uh, vocabulary. So for example, here is like a game like this is our sheet our gaming sheet this this will be redesigned this is just the early game developer thing i got oh look early access uh, <laughs> but, um so the whole idea is that you're only limited to the words that are on your character sheet you gotta write it in crayon and also with your offhand um you know just to really get you into the spirit and the mood um and uh, when you role play you have you just very limited vocabulary and dialogue to your narration so for example instead of saying i run up and smash the wolf with uh, my club we would say me smash wolf wolf so <laughs> that's the whole idea is that it it's something that you could play with all ages very simple um you all have to do is keep track of your words uh it's rented down you know uh there's not really any real magic the magic is i, I smash i smash rock uh, fire and, and there you go. You got the, the witch. That's that's the witch. Beautiful. So uh, it's the game is designed uh, for zero prep for the GM, uh, too. And it comes an adventure generator that works like Mad Libs. Uh, it's just really fun. And if you're into humorous games, um, just it, 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 it's like I know I know that I said disclaimer. This is this is something that it's just a very big pet project. But also, hey. It's uh, fun and I'm very proud. I'm very proud of you, my love, if you're watching. Yes, you are. I know. You're in the <laughs> room. Uh, but <laughs> I'm very proud of you and I want this to go. Uh, but yeah, 10 days left before fire. Get a computer. All right. But <laughs> enough about that. You know what we need to do? We need to go into the da -da -da bundle boss. Enter the bundle zone where you can find Atomic Robo. Available now on Bundle of Holding. So uh, if anybody's not familiar, um, the way I would describe Atomic Robo is it's a series of graphic novels that's basically, what if Hellboy was just about wacky science and not about horror? So wacky science adventures instead of horror cult adventures, I guess, is what I would describe it as. Um, 
and it's a very very fun comic very fun art uh it's fantastically good stuff and the rpg that came out a while back um is one of the the best expressions i've seen of the fate rule system so if you've been curious about getting into fate if you really love atomic robo or if you really love just kind of you know tesla and science adventure you know exclamation points and if the idea of a supervillain who is a hyper intelligent time traveling velociraptor with bad grammar gets you excited then you really should check out uh atomic robo there's a $13 tier that's basically gets you the core RPG. It gets you three of the graphic novels and then three of the employee manuals. So Banzai, you might be really into those because they're built like one of them actually, I think, is the, the time traveling Velociraptor, Dr. Dinosaur, uh, <laughs> telling people how to time travel and how to deal with stuff when they're time traveling. That's like the in-world document. Um, the bonus collection at $28 has the Majestic 12 RPG stuff. So that's kind of like a competing organization, basically. And then it's got six more of the graphic novels. So if you, for 30 bucks, you're going to get like nine graphic novels, three manuals, the RPG, all, all the stuff that you need, really good stuff. If you like comics, you like over-the-top adventure, uh, or you want to try out Fate, I really recommend it. Very, very, very cool. Uh, also, now for our favorite part, it's time for a... Kickstarter Queens now in courts. <laughs> so beautiful. I'm going to have to get a, qu uh, a crown after I move. Just so I get the full <laughs> costume going. All right. For our first thing, hey, guess what? It's It's got two days left. Uh, I don't know if I really need to explain it, but here's my explaining. Eee, look at it. I don't know if I'm pointing at the right direction. Is this it? Uh, basically, I've already backed this. Uh, I already got uh, very, very cute plush. Uh, this is a owlbear plush. Uh, it has two days left Sunday, February 14th. So right on Valentine's Day, uh, you can $35 get you one of these awesome, super cuddly looking babies and $65 will get you two. Um, it also comes with, as you go up, there's digital goods, uh, a short D&D 5th uh, edition adventure and art book. Um, and yeah, I, I, I saw something similar to this uh, when I went to Gen Con, with, like, you know, when there was the Gen Con, the physical Gen Con. And I remember running around and seeing all of these like beautiful stuffed animals in cases and they're like prototypes. And I was like, how am I supposed to buy a stuffed animal? Because... I, I have a problem with stuffed animal collections, and uh, yeah, this is this is just it's fluffy. Do you have a problem or a passion for stuffed animal collection? I, I feel like it's 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 a lot. It I don't I don't see the problem. The no problems detected. Yeah, yeah, you no just ripped a fine. hole in reality. No, 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 it's not. But yes. So the next project we wanted to talk about has six days left, and this is Our Shores, an RPG SEA collection or compilation, and that's for Southeast Asia. So this is uh, actually three different RPGs that are together in a collection that we're kind of driving for the campaign. But I believe that they just passed the stretch goal very recently to open up a zine effectively uh, for the work of nine more Southeast Asian creators. So this is, you know, the Philippines, Malaysia, um, uh, you know, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, that kind of area. The three kind of core games are Navathem, which is built on Powered by the Apocalypse and Forged in the Dark kind of system. And you're basically trying to prevent the apocalypse by, as far as I can tell, fighting super cool, huge, giant, badass monsters who kind of blur the line between is it a monster or is it the dungeon slash terrain? Like the one that they show the amazing art of is basically a really uh, like a hunched over huge giant guy who eats cities that have died and then takes their parts and like builds a coat out of them. So he's basically a crawling decrepit city trying to consume more of the world and you got to stop him. So that sounds cool. Uh, then we have uh, Capitalites, which is kind of a slice of life coming of age RPG. It's a GM list. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a little bit of a story game, but maybe with more structure, because there's a number of different playbooks that you would play of like young adults trying to figure out where they're going to live or what their role or, or who they should be as they kind of grow into adulthood in this city. Um, so uh, the playbook part, I think, is what really interests me there, because you can do a lot to 
keep a story really focused with a good playbook construction. So folks who would normally be uh, a little concerned about playing like a story game or a GMless game, uh, I feel like this might give you a little bit of structure to maybe kind of help you take the leap, basically. Uh, and then there's Maharlika. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But you're ready for this? This is a techno-mystic science fantasy mecha RPG inspired by Filipino mythology where you are piloting a giant magical robot at the behest of a megacorp in the future to defend a galaxy inspired by Filipino mythology and geography. So how, how do you say no to that? Uh, so I'm just really excited because, you know, we don't see a whole lot of, you know, first, we don't see a whole lot of non-European, non um, North American RPGs out there in general. And even further, we don't see a whole lot of Southeast Asian uh, work either, but there's a thriving community there. So I'm just excited that we get a peek into that, like a, a sample of it. Mm -hmm. uh, on another related note, I just, I just like to say that uh, there is just like a lot of people don't realize that there is a big scene out there that is totally different from the European side of like, imagining what rpgs are uh there's this whole other separate branch you know how like there's different branches of fairy tales that go on there's also different branches of just how styles of plays and and this is just something really cool and especially for myth uh, filipino mythology a lot of our historical figures in the philippines are pretty pretty cool dudes and ladies uh that's super murder folks in the coolest way possible uh but yeah, just a lot of really cool history behind it. And honestly, just I encourage people, we'll probably be talking about this more. I encourage people to look at a, uh, like uh, Eastern RPGs, uh, not just necessarily Eastern applying to Japanese and Korean, but there's also a whole like world of Asia out there. There's different flavors. We come, we come from the North and the South. We, we expand throughout. There's, you know. It's almost like it's a, a whole continent. Us. It's like a whole continent and then some, and uh, archipelagos and islands, you know, uh, all vast different people. So it's just, I'm, I'm excited just for myself. I'm like, oh yes, more, more stuff, but it'd be more exciting to see, especially when we get a lot of these people trying to do like, oh, Eastern inspired stuff when you could just take the stuff that we've already made and use it. But that's just my little antidote. We'll go ahead. E well, another project that is worth noting with six days left is the collector's edition of the Castles of Mad King Ludwig, uh, or Ludwig uh, is probably the correct way to pronounce it. Um, if anybody hasn't played this game, it's a real weird, wacky, uh, silly castle construction game. Uh, you know, you're, you're tasked with designing a castle for a historically capricious overlord who wants his bowling alley right next to his kitchen um, and a bathroom uh, in between. So it's just bizarre. You basically are kind of grabbing tiles and you're trying to fulfill different victory conditions, but you end up with like the dumbest, most difficult to navigate castle you can possibly imagine. Um, it's a very fun uh, game. It got some notoriety uh, for a while there. And there's a new collector's edition out on Kickstarter now. Um, it's got new art, uh, new components. It includes old expansions, has two new expansions. Most importantly to me, it has game trays inserts. So it's all organized and it sounds like you can just pull them out and have them ready to play. Um, you can upgrade the components so that you get metal coins or weighted chips and stuff like that. So it's a good game. If you enjoy the game and haven't picked up a copy yet, then it sounds like this might be the way to get kind of like the definitive version of it. Okay, hey, so moving on, we have Embryo Machine, a mecha war game. I don't know what it seems to be today with mechas, but it seems to be the theme uh, going on. This is six days left. I knew exactly by the name of this uh, Embryo Machine that the name of your mechas were called Embryo Machines, that this had to be Japanese. Um, uh, it is a anime inspired tabletop war game for one to six players. And basically you have these things uh, uh, called EMs and they're outfitted on the ends of these modular uh, decks and then they have to go at each other. And in true Japanese anime mech style, you have to declare 
uh, your attack at the same time that your opponent is declaring their attack. Uh, and then you have to try to outsmart each other. And it's a very fast paced uh, game uh, that comes with really cool little um, acrylic stand-ins uh, and a custom token bag and also a soundtrack, which is what I'm really the most interested in, is what is on this album. Um, so I hope it's epic, like Neon Genesis Evangelion, Escaflone music, because uh, mecha anime always has the most epic music. Uh, so yeah, this one is Embryo Machine, a mecha war game with six days left. Moving on, I've got SCP, the tabletop role-playing game. Uh, if you're not familiar with SCP, it is a collaborative, how can I describe it? A collaborative uh, group writing uh, horror project, uh, basically that started years ago where people can add on their own lore into this thing called the SCP organization, which stands for Secure, Contain, Protect, yes. Um, so this is a tabletop game in that world. Uh, where basically you play as somebody who is uh, inside of the facility and you have to try to work uh, to keep the supernatural phenomenon inside. If you've ever seen um, uh, Indiana Jones uh, when he goes into the big warehouse and there's all those like mythical artifacts and everything like that, that's how you can think about SCP. But instead of it being like, oh, cool, here's like the Holy Grail and like, here's all, you know, here's like all this nice, nice, cool stuff. It's just horrors. It's just a warehouse full of unimaginable Lovecraftian monstrosities. Uh, and you work in there because, you know, we all got to have jobs. Uh, so uh, you're trying to contain all those monsters inside of it. This looks like a really fun, gruesome game that will probably be full of uh, trauma. Um, if you're in, into that kind of a thing. So that's the SCP tabletop role-playing game with nine days left, ending on Sunday, February 21st. So then the last project we wanted to cover this week with 10 days left is Gods of Metal Ragnarok. Um, so this is from the people who brought us Outbreak, um, Altered Carbon, Alice is Missing, Icarus, uh, games like that. Uh, <laughs> And this is very much like a comedy RPG. It's it's very much like, what if someone decided to just make an, uh, a, a heavy metal RPG and tried to make as many puns and ridiculous connections and just nonsense that they could cram in there so they could just shout metal and just throw up the horns uh, and you get this game. Uh, you know, it's got a bunch of gods, but like instead of, normal gods like these are the gods of like moshing and death metal and shredding and stuff like that so uh it's it, it remarkably ridiculous uh, the gm screen um is a combination screen and vinyl record uh so you know uh shadows of the morkborg stuff we've seen popping up lately um notably that i thought was interesting there's no player races or ancestries they explicitly say that like you don't decide to be a dwarf or an elf or a dragonborn or anything. Um, you know, the whole concept of the game is that the gods of metal have descended into the boring, crappy, mundane world, plucked you out because your shining spirit of metal called to them. They've given you divine powers and they've put you in the world of metal so that you can fight off the apocalypse. Uh, so you get to just describe how you look however the hell you think you should look and whatever you think is cool and metal and awesome right ahead that's what you are uh so uh if if you're a metal fan if you are a comedy rpg fan uh if you know anybody uh who kind of admits that matches that criteria then i have a feeling you will at least giggle and chuckle uh and then maybe the pdf is worth picking up if not going whole hog into it um oh and also if you're one of those people who feels like D4s have not been given the credit and attention that they deserve, this is an entirely D4-based system, so your time has come. you got 10 days left. All righty, folks. Guess what? Uh, it is that time again. I'm sorry that Table Takes is over. But wait, wait, wait. 
don't worry, we have a whole slew of shows uh, ready for you for your consuming love. Hello, dog. Um, so <laughs> if you guys don't know, this is uh, more than just table takes. Gen Con has a whole like list of things that you can go ahead and enjoy uh, during your week. So this is all in a specific tender time, by the way. So starting Monday, 6 p.m., board games with the Brothers Merce. They're two brothers. They play games. They're going to show you how it plays together wednesdays this game gets dicey is a uh a, on 1 30 uh two people play uh basically on different parts of the world and trying to coordinate how to play online games and of course fridays you get us on table takes at 2 p.m um and remember folks if you miss our episode here live on twitch we got about 24 hours until it pops up on youtube don't forget to follow, like, subscribe, smash that like button, comment, all that good, good stuff. And if you want to just stay a part of the community that is Gen Con, we also have an official Discord. I want to thank all of you guys for joining us here in chat and also to my wonderful co-hosts, uh, Isabella, Derek, and Emma. And I hope you guys have a wonderful uh, Lunar New Year. And remember to stay warm, stay healthy, and uh, eat lots of noodles. <laughs>